Okay, hi, um, Nish, Nish, Nish Kumar. Hello, Akram. How How are you? are you? I'm good. Yeah, really well. It's lovely to see you. Yeah, Hey, lovely Ali. to see you too. Hello, Ali. <laughs> so, um, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, it's it's amazing. I've been wanting to talk to you for ages. I think the last time we spoke was uh, two years ago at the uh, Edinburgh International Festival, and um, yeah, I had such a good time. chatting with you um it was really hard to Yeah, it describe was great. You were um, you were kind enough to lend the veneer of credibility to a program that I was presenting about the arts. I was uh, we were very, we were all very appreciative of you coming on. yeah I have to say I was really excited and terrified because you know I didn't know if the questions were loaded with uh, that you are being sarcastic or you're being serious but I said I'm to be quite serious <laughs> yeah, I'm actually I'm actually quite an earnest fellow uh one on one. <laughs> Coming from a comedian, okay. I don't know if Yeah, yeah, take that seriously. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was definitely. Uh, I guess it. I guess people don't know what to expect when they're being interviewed by a comedian because I think the the concern is that it's going to be some sort of Ali G situation. But no, I was taking my responsibilities as an arts journalist very seriously. Right. No, I loved it. I loved doing it, and I, so I wanted to uh, have a chat with you. And I thought, well, how do I get you on? you know, uh, a, a kind of a situation where we can, where, where we can talk about what's going on. And um, uh, Emma Gladstone from Dance Umbrella suggested this beautiful idea, which I think is, uh, yeah, I feel very honored to be part of it. So thank you so much for giving up your time. And the first question My absolute I had pleasure. for you uh, was, um, what did you have for breakfast this morning? I've, so far for breakfast, I've had a banana and a black coffee. It's Okay. uh, the, Is that normal? yeah, that's very normal. Uh, it's I the nature of what 15 years of being a comedian has done to me is that I am not a morning person. I'm not instinctively a morning person. And even though, you know, for most of this year, what I've been doing is working office hours in writing rooms. It's it still feels unnatural to me. So when my alarm went off this morning, I was like, oh, my God, what's what's going on? Like what? And so my body can only really handle a, a, a sort of some, some fruit and some caffeine Yeah. uh, before before about 11 a.m. Just from years of sleeping in because I was doing a gig somewhere the night before. Yeah. And do you usually eat a big meal at lunch? Yeah, I normally eat a big meal at lunch and a big meal at dinner. I'm a big believer in, uh, you know, how they say you're supposed to sort of eat quite a lot at the start of the day and then, you know, snack and have slightly smaller amounts of food over the course. I'm a big believer, small breakfast, massive lunch, massive dinner, kebab, Yeah. sleep. I'm a huge, I, I, I'm a real, I've got my own, I've got very innovative, Yeah. innovative <laughs> that's a that's diet. a really dancer's diet there, kebab. Absolutely. Yeah, you just you just uh, mentioned the dancers that you mentioned my diet. <laughs> Do you still, you, I mean, you look like an athlete because you are an athlete, you know, dance is, I guess, like part art and part athletics almost. Did you find, do you find that you still keep to that sort of disciplined thing? Do you think that there'll ever be a point where you're just like, you know what, I'm going to have fried chicken, half a bottle of vodka and go to bed. I don't drink, but I, uh, but I, um, I do go for the fried chicken. Um, Right, yeah. uh, I've been doing that for years, to be honest with you. I, I eat really badly. I eat really unhealthily until um, my wife came along and said, um, we got married in 2012 and she changed my whole diet. So I never had the color green on my plate. So um, I was quite horrified to see it. I, I see it in the garden, but not on my plate. <laughs> So that was quite quite um, disturbing for me, and then I got used to it, and I started to appreciate it be because of uh, the way she made it. And um, she's an amazing cook, so I, I, I yeah, uh, I started eating healthy. But secretly, you know, when I'm on tour, she's not on tour, so I can, you know, sometimes order kebab or you know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> I'm glad that I think I just assumed that because obviously I know what it's like to be a touring comedian and how much of that involves eating terrible food. I'm glad that when dancers are on tour, it's the same. <laughs> Yeah, it's no, the same I mean, not thing. just dancers, athletes too. Wow. I mean, you know, I suppose when you come towards a performance, then, you know, I freak out because there's a, uh, like, for, for example, my solo. So I have to, you know, I, I have to go, I always go, um, I'm a bit vain like that. And I'm like, oh God, I've got to take my top off uh, for this last scene. Yeah. I better start getting into shape. 
And in right. terms of physical shape, I'm okay. But in terms of um, the kebab on my stomach, I mean, <laughs> what I eat reveals itself on the shape of my stomach. So I get really paranoid. So I start going on this kind of extreme diet. Do you do that? <laughs> do, you, do you worry about no, your body? Or I'll be, you I'll be honest with you. If I'm on stage and at any point the audience can see my torso, something has gone terribly wrong. <laughs> something, if I ever find myself shirtless doing a comedy show, something has gone badly <laughs> askew. I should, I should, at all points, I should have my shirt on. Yeah. Well, listen, um, I'm not going to ask you to take your shirt off today. Uh, but, <laughs> but I, I wanted to know, uh, on, a, on, a, on a more serious note, how, have you, how has 2020 20 been affecting you or has it affected you and in what way has it affected you and your art well I guess like the bit the first thing that I always have to say is most importantly I, I haven't had it and family members of mine that have had it are okay so I guess that's the first question you, you, that everyone has to address is just to be like like your priority is always like you know, we're very fortunate because we've not lost anybody. Right. And, you right. know, it's, um, which is, you know, which is, you're such a fortunate position to be, in, you know, in a country where 50,000, 55,000 people have lost their lives, you know, it's, you're lucky to not be touched by it directly. And friends of mine have lost people and um, it's, it's a heartbreaking thing. Um, in terms of my work, I've also been very fortunate that I haven't uh, lost a huge amount of work. I've, I've largely been able to work through this entire year just because through a series of professional coincidences, I actually wasn't supposed to be touring this year. So right. my year was basically supposed to be making these two programmes and we've been able, we were able to make both of those programs. The first one is a, a sort of topical comedy show that I do on the BBC called The Mass Report. And that was supposed to start uh, the week after the first lockdown, um, right. the, uh, back in the beginning of April. Yeah. Um, you know, as this thing sort of made its way towards us, there increasingly started to be conversations about you know, how is this possible? Because we film in a studio with the 300 yeah. strong audience and, you know, we're all in a rooms together writing the show and, be, and uh, you know, it's so sort of steadily became apparent that this wasn't going to be possible. And my, my producer, my, my producer had absolutely no confidence in the government's yeah. messaging uh, in March right. and was, was, was correct, was correct to be. Um, and he basically reorganized everything Right. And um, we, we filmed things from home. And what was strange about it was that there were so many conversations about the practicalities of it, that it was only when we came to write the first episode that we suddenly thought, oh, how do you do comedy yeah. now? Because yeah. because all the conversations were so focused on we equipment and how do we organise the editing and how can we all work without being in the same room. And so, it, it, to be honest, it was probably quite good because it just meant that we were so focused on practical concerns. We didn't have time to worry about how, what you actually do once mm -hmm. you've got the camera set up. And it once we started, it was, you know, I remember the first writing meeting where, you know, we, it's our first sort of Zoom meeting where we're looking out of these windows that we're now all very familiar with. Mm -hmm. And, um, for a show that makes jokes about the news, there was a sort of, <laughs> there wasn't a particularly light, frivolous atmosphere um, at the first meeting because everyone was just sort of saying, I don't know how to. And then you slowly, the first conversations you have are, what's the tone of this? How do we keep the comedy funny and keep the comedy present mm. without undermining the fundamental seriousness of, of what's happening? Um, and it, it was something that we wrestled with. I, I'm, I'm really happy with where we ended up with it. But um, how do you do that, Nish? How do you uh, confront very uh, challenging, complex issues and have the courage, not just the courage, but the ability to show it in a different light? Um, I mean, I find it very important. I mean, you know, I've been following your work, of course, and um, a lot of, I'm a huge follower of Dave Chappelle, yeah. Um, Eddie Izzard and um, artists like that and I just find it extraordinary, uh, extraordinary gift to be able to uh, reveal 
the situation through a different lens rather than the lens that we all look at it, which is so close, you know, when you're so close, it's very personal, but at the same time, um, very heavy. And somehow Dave Chappelle was my kind of um, go-to guy uh, when I was down. How, how, how do you, yeah, uh, not sidestep it, but how do you overcome that? Well, I think it's, I think you have to always make sure that you know who the targets of your jokes are mm -hmm. and who are you who are you really aiming the satire at and I think as long as you're not making light of people who have suffered and lost people yeah. I think then you're um I think I think you're all right I think you can go to really dark and difficult and complicated places mm -hmm. as long as it's very clear that you're aiming the jokes at people that deserve to have them aimed at. So as long as the fundamental, as long as the building blocks of what you're doing are targeting government policy, targeting inconsistencies, mm. targeting people that deserve to be targeted, I think you're all right. I think, you, I think, I think if you're making light of people suffering, mm. that it's, pro it's probably not going to be very, it's probably not going to be very funny. Um, whereas I think if you're, um, I think as long as you're aiming it at people that deserve to be aimed at. Also, I think there was, there was a lot of comedy to be had in the fundamental ridiculousness of the situation of yeah. me in this room with a full camera set up and having, you know, having to do my own hair and makeup for the first time. And it, it, you know, it did look, it, it did look silly and it did look ridiculous. So there's a lot of, um, you know, I like to be the butt of my own jokes where possible um, because I think that that's, um, that's, that's also a fun way of ingratiating yourself with the audience. And also it was nice to be able to say to the audience, look, we're sort of all in the same boat. You know, you're trapped in your house and I'm coming to you from my house. Yeah. It, it, it was an interesting thing because it felt more... Um, it felt more intimate yeah. and um, it felt closer to doing a live performance because, you know, if you're, if you're talking to people in their homes from your home, yeah. if there's something about it that feels, you feel very connected to mm. the audience. Yeah. Um, and it really did feel like we were all in the same boat. Yeah. And I mean, I, I really connect with that because I was about to say, because uh, uh, after, you know, I've been analyzing comedy for a while and people, uh, 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 people asking me why. And there's something about humor that, I, that I've lost um, as, I, as I grew up into a teenager. Um, and when I went into contemporary dance uh, and the contexts uh, or the themes that I tackled were very heavy and they've become heavier since my children have been born. Um, about the future, about the issues of uh, climate change, about, you know, everything really. Um, <clears throat> and I really, <clears throat> one of the things that I uh, uh, realized, the common denominator with a lot of comedian, comedians uh, 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 is that they deflect the, the, the kind of um, opinion um, through them. Yeah. So it becomes personal first. It's from, guys, this is, let me just explain my experience experience yeah. it's a personal experience and somehow it gives permission for it to then become a, a more a slightly more universal experience it's not for everyone but you know it, it opens it up and that's how I, I that's how I could connect because in a sense I'm whenever I'm looking at a narrative or a myth or a story I have to find myself in it the yeah. question that I ask is always um uh, 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 what is the story then the second question is why this story and the why this story is really about why do I want to tackle this story? Where, where, where do I find myself within this story? How do I identify this with this story? And the third one is where the craft lies, I feel, is how do I exp uh, express this story? You know? Yeah. So the why is, uh, I, I noticed that the, uh, a lot of comedians take it through themselves, their own personal experience. And, but at the same time, I was wondering, like, when you were talking, like, um, I have someone, when I, you know, I never... I, I, I was never good at talking. Language, words came to me very late in my life. Um, apparently my mother said that at the age of seven, I could, I could string together a full sentence in English. 
that's quite late. But she said, uh, I was really shocked when I heard that and she saw the shock on my face and she said, but at the age of three, you could do a 10 minute choreography. So my language was very different, you know, um, but I, so I'm the, I'm the exact, I was the exact opposite of that. <laughs> uh, it's, I guess, you know, I guess like, I guess it's one of those things where you sort of go, you are, I, I don't understand the science behind nature versus nurture, but I, I guess in so many people I know, you reveal yourself very quickly. And I, I, I couldn't walk for a while. <laughs> right. But, I, but, I, but my, my, my parents always say that I was like forming full sentences incredibly yeah. quickly yeah. and I was talking a lot and yeah. it's actually, I've never really thought about it. It's a story that I know quite, I hear quite a lot from other comedians yeah. is that they were maybe more articulate than they were capable of movement yeah. at quite a young age. But that's, so were you, so not only were you, you were choreographing dance routines. No, no I was learning uh, uh, my mother's choreography, actually. That's incredible. But you That's know, incredible. Uh, yeah. I mean, it was, it was, uh, I, I was, um, language never came to, uh, sp spoken words never, I was very intimidated because I grew up in a community where, you know, they came over from Bangladesh, my parents' community, yeah. and that generation, and they just lived through a war, you know, 71. Uh, yeah. East Pakistan became Bangladesh. So, their first fund, you know, fundamental principle was their children has to be educated, highly academically yeah. educated. So every all the kids went to private school, and so I was really intimidated. Where did you Where did you grow up? Uh, Wimbledon. Wimbledon. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think we talked about this last time. Yeah, but that's yeah, right. That's because it's not you know I, I grew up in Croydon, so I know that area well. So, that's but you were yeah. so your parents here in like the early mid seventies. Yeah. Late, and late mid seventies. Oh uh, no, right, no. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, you're right. Early mid seventies. Yeah. Yeah, which is kind of, it's the same sort of time that my mum came to this country as well. And like, yeah, it's. I. I Were I you think pushed about highly academic? Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, it was. Um, and I, I, I get it. What went wrong? I, I mean, I. Like, <laughs> I I maintain whenever I hear stories about me as a child, I was like, I was really telling you who I was quite early on. Yeah. You know, like if your kid is like able to quote long stretches of Ace Ventura Pet Detective, you're yeah. probably not harboring a cancer cure. You yeah. know, I uh, I <laughs> because yeah, I think it was I I you know, it's one of those funny things where my parents are like, why are you like, we can't believe this happened. And I was like, this was the inevitable consequence of but everything how, that you saw. How do they feel about you now? Well, now they're very happy. You know, they're very yeah. excited. They're watching this right now. They're very excited that I'm talking to you. You know, like it's, uh, this This is the sort of thing that lends legitimacy to my career. <laughs> but how did, you, how did your parents feel if they were pushing you to be academic? Um, actually, the community were pushing, putting pressure on my parents to put pressure on me. Um, and they made them feel, they made my parents feel that I was a failure because I never got into private school and my sister was highly academic. So right. um, I think my father's, uh, my mother was secretly supporting me all the time. And wow. she said, it's only because they fear you. But I had a very, very complex relationship with my parents because my father, bless him, he's, he's a good man, but you know, he, he had some, a lot of issues. So in one ear, since I was a child, he would whisper like a mantra, um, you are a failure. You will achieve. Right. You will achieve to nothing. This is the whisper that went into one ear. Wow! On every day, so you know it shapes the way you you see yeah. the world, yourself in the world. And in the other ear, my mother would whisper, um, uh, "Anybody who says that fears your talent, fears of what wow. you can do. They fear that the fact that you can actually achieve it, and they could not." So wow. I was very conflicted and confused, just as I was conflicted and confused. Um, growing up above my dad's restaurant in the living room, we had a living. You know, we lived above my dad's rest, Indian restaurant, and my mother used to work at Decca Records. Uh, I don't know if you remember Decca Records. Really? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. As, as a part-time job, and she would bring these scratched records back. They would give it to her, or she stole them. But she always said they gave. gave <laughs> my father would be playing Bollywood films in the same room while my mother, um, uh, you know, uh, put records of Tom Jones, um, Abba. Wow. So I grew up in this kind of conflicting. So my mother and father were both very, um, very, very different. And so I, wow. you know, but my mother saved me in a sense. And now my father is super proud. I mean, to the point where my whole street 
probably knows that we're doing this talk because my father <laughs> would go around last night or call up in the phone book. Akram is on, uh, going to be with Nish Kumar. If you don't know Nish Kumar, I can tell you the CV. And so he would quote this CV. I mean, like he is an amazing marketing person. Um, so it, uh, they're proud, let's say. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. you get there in the end. I, I understand the impulse because their whole agenda has to be, you know, if you have if you cut if you immigrate somewhere you have you have to try and push your children to do something yeah. that the society that you're living in deems necessary so that they don't just kick you out and i mean one of the worst things about the one of the many appalling things about the windrush scandal is that it does confirm in a sense our parents worst fears yeah. that you know the that the whims of the government can dictate whether or not you get removed from the country. And in a sense, it does validate all of their concerns and the reasons that, you know, they're not, they weren't pushing us to be doctors and lawyers because they believed that that was, you know, whatever we were destined to be. They were just doing that so that we could exactly. make ourselves part of the society. Yeah. And it, it would be harder for them to extricate us from it. Um, and how do you feel about, I'm really interested to know what you feel about your work and what the pandemic is going to do to it. I mean, there's the sort of practical concerns about arts sure. venues and arts funding. Um, and But you've, you know, you've never shied away from really difficult subjects. No. And I... translating them into into dance. Is, is there something, do you feel the sense, because I also know lots of creative people at the moment that are, strugg that are really struggling yeah. because you know, especially people who are writing scripts or novels, uh, they're being told by, you know, their publishers and editors and agents and managers that, oh, this is a fantastic time for you to do, uh, write that novel or write that screenplay yeah. because you're all just home. But they are finding it very difficult because you're not home on some grand writing retreat. You're home because there is a lethal pandemic in yeah. the air. Yeah. And that's not particularly conducive to creativity. So I'm interested to know from your perspective, do you feel like you're seeing the roots of something? Are you having the ideas for something that you might be able to act on? I am, I, I oh, it's a tough question. I mean, I suffered, uh, I, I would say, you know, I, I, I go into the studio, I have a studio in my back garden, a small studio um, that I go in every morning as a ritual. It's like brushing my, you know, yeah. brushing your teeth. You do that every day. So. I go in at, uh, I wake up at six, I go in at seven or 7.30 and I, you know, end up, I stay there for four hours, three to four hours. And then I come out and my life, my life begins. Um, yeah. I stopped doing that during the first lockdown and I would go in once a week, maybe, maybe twice, but I was finding excuses. These, these um, monstrous voices going, you don't need to do this. Why are you doing it? Mm. What the, what's the point? And my wife said, um, you are depressed. You're going through depression. Yeah. This is what depression looks like for you, and I looked looked at myself and I and I realized that's what it was. I was I was going through heavy depression, so you know there was this wonderful project like with Jonathan Glazer uh, with Sadler's Wells and um, Jonathan Glazer being this wonderful film director and oh I, yeah one of, has made a couple of my favorite Sexy Beast is yeah Sexy Beast is one of the great British gangster movies yeah yeah well he proposed the f uh, a, a, particular project with other choreographers and I said yes and then my parents were a bit vulnerable and my, my yeah. father was here he was stuck in Bangladesh and I pulled out it was the first time I ever pulled out of a project when I'd committed quite far on you know we yeah. went quite far and I realized for those five months I pushed off everything anything creative I stopped being creative mm. I felt like I needed to grieve um, and then I started going back into a studio um, because a young animated because another project came along wonderful project with MIF and he's a beautiful animator Naman Azari and we started having I said okay fine I'll do it and we started having a conversation and immediately I realized through grieving I had to share these stories I had to release them somehow I yeah. can't I can't just contain it and keep it because it will poison me um, you know and within that grieving was not just climate change but was the chaos of COVID was um, the reaction of all the governments or most of the governments around the world mm. and how they dealt with it um, was definitely Black Lives Matter 
that was a huge yeah. part of you know uh, my grieving process and then um this one young you know animator pulled me out of it and i didn't even realize i was pulled out because my wife said you're going into the studio even on your off day so you're doing seven days a week of training i said yeah, yeah i feel i feel i can be creative um but it's all gonna i think it's so in a sense with the animator i'm already responding to covid you know that's uh, right the experience of COVID. I'm sure. Is it the same for you? Did you well, suffer I, depression, th- or did you? Did you? I mean, you the, were working, so. The thing that, that I've been blessed by ceaseless deadlines. Right. I think if left to my own devices, if what because what I would normally be doing outside of TV is like writing a live show to tour, yeah. and but with the way that I work and the way that lots of comics work, some comics don't work like this, but the way lots of comics work is, you know, obviously we're testing material constantly. So you're constantly getting up in front of an audience and, you know, you're constantly testing material. And obviously I wouldn't have been able to do that or I've been able to do gigs on Zoom, which is great. But I think, I don't know how how motivated I would have felt, but I've just had constant deadlines. And that's been the best thing for my creativity because the you know literally the second week of lockdown we had to write a tv show and it has to be on yeah bbc2 yeah. on friday night at 10 o'clock half an hour of something has to happen yeah. and that is that that'll solve for me personally that'll solve all my problems because when when something has to be completed yeah. it um you work with, well with deadlines yeah i it's why i i, I can't even wrap my mind around somebody writing a novel the idea of having that discipline to finish that is is so alien to me whereas normally i mean we we both broadly live in a world where it's the theater's booked the theater's booked so something had better happen and but obviously with that without being able to perform live yeah it's you know it it definitely is it's definitely been helpful to have constant deadlines and it definitely has sort of when that stopped a couple of weeks ago I felt I felt a bit I just felt a bit down yeah and my 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 partner was saying she was just like well you're not working that's why you're feeling a bit listless yeah and actually every week you're now just engaging with the reality of this in some ways yeah even though in your head you think oh I'm reading the news I'm engaging with the news I'm very informed about it every week Covid was a problem yeah. professional problem to be solved yeah you know ha- how do we turn this into comedy for half an hour it was all my mind was focused on and it was stopping me from engaging in some ways with the kind of terrifying reality yeah. of what's what's going on around you yeah. um and yeah so only re- I, I feel like to, i feel in a strange way it's only really hit me recently the true enormity and magnitude of everything that's happened because it is just you know covid George Floyd, Black Lives Matter, everything that's happened yeah. has been in some ways, I, I've been, I've had an outlet to deal with my feelings and, yeah. you know, move on to the, move through it. And if I feel like to some ways, to some extent, it only all just hit me yeah. a couple of weeks ago when I stopped working. I was just going to say, Nish, um, you know, uh, uh, Ben from the production said, uh, we've got five minutes remaining. Thanks. Uh, um, <laughs> and that was, I think, five minutes ago. Uh, <laughs> Now we could we could be rebellious and just ignore that and just do another hour. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, guys, go for it. I don't know. Oh, no, no, no. I'll, I'll be in trouble. They'll just cut us off in mid conversation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, listen, it's been such a gift uh, uh, to spend this this time with you. I I miss you and I love conversing with you and I want to learn more from you. And at some point, um, I'd love to 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 talk about some ideas. Um, to understand uh, the connection between movement and and uh, the movement of com- comedians and comedy. So Nish, you, you've been so generous with your time. Thank this you. This has so been much. an absolute pleasure, Akram. Thank you so much. It's been it's been great catching up with you. It's lovely to see you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.